Okay, in terms of the stuff, welcome to PHI 2010 Introduction to Philosophy. We'll do the usual exciting first day stuff, which is of course going over the exciting syllabus and signing the exciting uh, roll so you can have that attendance hole lifted so you can get that evil, evil money. Uh, so first thing, of course I'll pass around the attendance thing. Your name is currently on here. I printed it up uh, yesterday, it might already be out of date. And so just initial by your name. If you're not here, of course you can't hear me, so nothing to do there. And if you've added the class uh, since yesterday, uh, just put your name down on the bottom, and I'll, if you're the official uh, Rattler thingy, I'll put you down as attending. If you need to add the class, uh, pretty much the main way to add is if you're a graduating senior, then they'll give an override to go to the main office, to a Tucker Hall, to do the adding. Okay, I'm Jock Boss here. I've been teaching here since 1993. Went to the Ohio State University. They do make us say you know, the, because like there's many Ohio States around the world. And I've been teaching here a super long time, so I've been doing this a while. To turn to the syllabus, this is of course introduction to philosophy about the philosophy stuff. And the pertinent bureaucratic stuff is this. Um, there's, because I'm kind of lazy, uh, I have a night class I teach as well, so all the stuff applies to the day class. So rather than creating like two sets of PowerPoints, I just lazily have night and day. Uh, same content, just different times. My office is two or three Tucker Hall, so right down there. Uh, here's my phone, but of course, who uses phones these days? Here's my email. And I check it uh, regularly. If you don't hear back from me uh, rapidly, there's a chance that it ends up in the uh, junk mail filter. The family email especially hates Yahoo, because everyone hates Yahoo apparently, and Hotmail. And so if you have like a Yahoo account or Hotmail account, or just send me lots of like spam stuff, it ends up in the junk mail. But occasionally it puts things in there that don't seem to be junk. So if you don't get a response from me quickly, there's a chance it's in the junk pool, because I'm really good about responding to the email. Office hours, uh, pretty straightforward. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, noon to two, uh, basically right up until this class. Down there in two or three Tucker Hall. Unless uh, something dire happens or I get dragged off to a meeting, I'm reliably there. If I do have a meeting that I know about ahead of time, and I am on all the committees, I'll always put an announcement up on Blackboard well in advance so you know where I'm not going to be. That way you don't show up and say, where is this person? What are they doing? What are they paying them for? You may still say that anyways, but at least you'll know where I'm not. So what are you going to cover in this introduction to philosophy? Well, kind of the obvious answer is philosophy stuff. Now, I've broken the class into four convenient parts. So part one, two, three, and four. And the way the class is divided up, if you looked on Blackboard, you'll see that there's exam for each of the parts, plus an exciting final as well as quizzes for each part. And so the class is split up into four distinct parts. And for each part, there's a set of quizzes, lots of quizzes, because the more the better, as we'll see in a bit, and an exam. And there's a final exam for all of the stuff. So for part one, there'll be quizzes just for part one, an exam for part one, likewise for two, three, and four. So each of the sections is self-contained, except for the final, which covers all the things. Now the first part will have the introduction to the introduction to philosophy. Kind of redundant, but there you go. Then we'll look at how to write philosophy papers, and I'm working from the assumption, especially since this is intro to philosophy, that no one has written a philosophy paper. So there's no assumption of previous experience. If you've had a philosophy class before, then you'll have an edge. If you haven't, and this is all new, you won't be at any disadvantage because we'll go through all the stuff you need to do the paper. Again, no assumption you've ever done this before. We'll cover argument basics, we'll cover you know, the writing stuff, and we'll go over the paper in detail on how to do it. We'll also look at the origin of Western philosophy, talking about where philosophy comes from and what it is, and then finish up with our first actual reading from our good dead friend Socrates in the Apology, which is basically his trial before his death in the Crime. And of course Socrates died way back then, and is still dead today. 
Then we head into part two, philosophy and religion. You know, God, afterlife, all that stuff. We'll begin with our good dead friend, St. Anselm, with a classic ontological argument, which roughly put is this. God is perfect, so we exist. Because if he didn't exist, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he does. Done. Then we'll turn to the five ways by St. Thomas Aquinas, who was also dead, and then to our good dead friend, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, arguing about God. And then we'll turn to kind of an opposing viewpoint by our good dead friend, uh, David Hume, Scottish guy, talking about the classic problem of evil, which everyone's probably heard about this in some form or another, especially in light of you know, various church scandals. The question is, if God is all good, all powerful, all knowing, why is there an evil? Why does a God just not allow that stuff to happen? Why does he permit evil? Or sometimes people put it like a book title form, why does bad things, or why do bad things happen to good people? And it's one of the central problems in you know, philosophy and religion about evil. Why do we have it? And Hume tries to give an account of why that's there. Then we turn to immortality, which is basically not ever done be pretty handy. And Hume basically says, mm, you probably don't got that. Um, spoiler there. Then we'll turn lastly, or next to lastly, to our good dead friend Immanuel Kant and his look at the ontological argument. And Kant basically does this. He writes a lot of stuff in German, but then he also writes about arguments for God. And he claims there's only three ways you can argue for God. None of them work, so you can't prove God's existence. On the flip side, though, you can't disprove God. So what do you do? Well, stay tuned for a future episode in which all questions will be answered. Then lastly in this section, we'll turn to our good dead friend, Blaise Pascal, which sounds like an action hero name, or a porn star name, or possibly both. Why not both? And he had the classic uh, wager that God is your best bet. You can't know if God exists or not, because you know, he's God. But if you're putting your money down on the table, always bet on God. Otherwise you go to hell, so bet for God. Then we'll turn to perhaps the strangest area of philosophy, namely metaphysics, which is all about the nature of reality, what is really real for real. And epistemology, which is how do you know about stuff? What can you know? What can't you know? We'll begin appropriately enough with our good dead friend Plato, in the classic um, analogy or allegory of the cave, if you ever saw the classic 1999 movie, The Matrix, you've kind of seen the cave and Descartes, you know, the problem of how do you know what's really real. Or if you've seen more recently the movie Inception, or many of the, um, uh, the Netflix series, the Black Mirror series, many of those episodes are very epistemic, you know, questions about how do you know what's really with a much better budget than I've got, obviously. Next, we'll turn to our good dead friend, Descartes. He's the guy that, he didn't invent what's called the problem of the external world, which is, how do you know this is real, and not a dream, or a virtual reality, or an evil demon messing with you? He didn't invent that scenario, but he refined it and perfected it. And so we'll look at that classic problem. Then we'll turn to metaphysics, which is all about, again, what is really real for real. We'll begin by looking at what it is to be a person. And it's an important question because it has implications, obviously, in metaphysics, but also in ethics. Because if I were to take my backpack and throw it out the window, that would be really stupid. But it would not, unless I hit somebody, but it wouldn't be like a crime or anything. Breaking the window probably would be. But if I grabbed a person and threw them out of the window, that would probably be bad. Unless it was a bad person, it might be okay. Depending on your view of like ethics of people in windows. Now, so being a person does supposedly grant a person moral status. And so there's quite a bit going on there. Also, it isn't to the ethics, there's also tying back to immortality, there's also the question of what is it to be you and how long can that be kept going? 
for example, it's, been, it's currently sci-fi, but what companies, some companies are working on is basically memory backups. Initially, what they'll probably come up with is something to help with things like dementia and Alzheimer's. You know, like today, we all use our phones to keep our calendars and stuff on them. And eventually, <coughs> they'll have it imprinted, you know, implanted in your, probably in your head or someplace else. And that way, you can have all the stuff stored there, you know, as, especially as people's memories fail. And what the scientists are talking about is just as you back up like an important Word file or your photos, et cetera, or your phone, you can back up you. So that way when you die, you keep on going. But a very important question would be, is that entity that's been backed up and keeps on going, is that really you? Or is it just something that thinks it's you? And it does matter because if it's not you, you're dead. And something's walking around as if it was you, which is kind of creepy. But if it is you, then, then great. And we'll talk about this when we talk about our good dead friend, John Locke. Even though he was locking back in the you know, uh, 17th century, 1600s, he did anticipate that problem. What if you could copy someone's personality, memories, consciousness, and duplicate that? What, you know, would that be the person? And we'll see what Locke has to say about that. Then we'll look at our good dead friend, David Hume again, who says, <laughs> basically he says, you haven't got any of this. There is no you. And then we'll go to our good dead friend, Buddha, who says, there is no you, there is no me, there is no spoon, there is nothing. And then we'll take a look at ghosts and minds. How can you have you know, ghosts in the context of philosophy? then some time travel, and then lastly, some Taoist metaphysics. Finally, in part four, the end of the parting, we'll have our look at value theory. As we'll see, value theory covers things like ethics, aesthetics, political and social philosophy, all the things that deals with matters of worth. We'll begin, of course, with ethics, and we'll look at the two big dogs of ethics utilitarianism from our good dead friend John Stuart Mill and what's called deontology from our good dead friend Immanuel Kant once again. Now the reason why I call these the big dogs of ethics is because most ethical debates typically today get cashed out in terms of either this or this. Utilitarianism, you might have heard about that people talk about it you know, in popular terms, uh, but everyone's familiar with it. It's the idea that, in a nice way, the greatest good for the greatest number. Or less nice, perhaps, the ends justify the means, which can be pretty terrible. And so utilitarianism takes the view that when we're deciding what to do, we weigh the harms and benefits. And we try to create the most good. Thanks to uh, driverless cars, Utilitarianism has gotten a lot of um, play on social media. You might have even heard of it yourself. It's called uh, the trolley problem, which is, you know, you get, you get um, some tracks. And a trolley. And for some reason, there's one person here and say five people here. And the trolley's cruising around along. You can't stop it. And your choice is, you know, kill one or kill five. And most people's intuitions are that you kill, yeah, one or five if you're like you know, evil and stuff. But in general, people go for the one, and that's our utilitarian sentiment. You know, if you've got the people have to die, it's better that fewer people die. And the reason why it's relevant to the driverless cars is because the cars are going to be in scenarios where they have to decide who do they kill. You know drive along the road, you know, you're driving, you're in your new, you know, Tesla or Google or Apple car, it's, you know, watching a movie or something, and suddenly, like, a bunch of school kids run in front of your car. So your car is the computer, your car are the algorithms, are programmed to kill you or kill the kids. Because if they swerve to avoid the kids, they may collide with their car, killing you. Or they may slam into a, you know, tree or telephone pole. So the more morality has to be 
programmed into the cars. Now, I'm sure there's a company coming along in which you pay more for the car, but the, the car is programmed to kill everybody but you. So you'll just plow through those kids. Mm -hmm. Terrible, but it's all, you know, it's a matter of, of value. And utilitarianism does deal with that question. If you're driving along, is it better that you die or all the kids mm -hmm. die? Then we'll turn to art and beauty, aesthetics. We'll look at our reading from our good dead friend Oscar Wilde and the new aesthetics, talking about, you know, what is art. Finally, we'll finish up looking at political and social philosophy looking at a long-standing question, relevant today, been relevant pretty much forever, which is a question of liberty. How free should we be? On one extreme, we'll look at fascism, which is, you don't really need freedom. The state decides how free you should be. You don't need much of that. Then we'll look at John Stuart Mill, a good dead friend, talking about liberty. And his view is basically, it's one that's popular in the United States now, which is you're free to do what you want as long as you don't hurt other people. Once it crosses over to hurting other people, it can be restricted. But if you're not doing anything that hurts other people, it's okay. Then we'll look at anarchism from our good dead friend uh, Emma Goldman, which is basically just get rid of the state. No state whatsoever. So the state is absolute. This view is the state should give us a lot of freedom, and this is anarchy, anarchy now, um, get rid of the state. So that will be our adventures in philosophy, beginning with what philosophy is about, and ending, of course, in total anarchy, where we burn down all civilization. Good times. That's extra credit. You destroy civilization. So how does the grade stuff work? Before we go into the grade stuff, anything about the previous stuff, or how to destroy civilization that needs more stuff. Now, your grade in this class depends on three main things. The paper, of which there is one, and it's 30%, because, you know, Gordon rule, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's also exams. There's a total of five exams available, the best four of which count. Also in the exam folder are these assessment things. And the assessment things are not exams, but I put it in the assessment in the exam folder so they'd be scary and so you can find them. Um, but those assessment things, in case you're wondering about those, that is so we have data for assessment, which we need to give to the state so then they don't take away any more money. If you're familiar with how uh, performance-based funding works, basically it works like this. All the state schools in Florida are ranked, and they set the rankings up to screw family, basically. For real. I mean, every time we meet a ranking, they're like, oh, we don't, we're going to change that. But anyways. Uh, and so we have to have that data. So the practical need for that data is not only to like improve our classes, et cetera, but to have data to give to the state. So that's why that's in there. Now, getting back to the exam thing, there's five total exams. Four standard ones, one final. There's one exam for each section plus the final. The standard exams, the four normal ones, are 50 questions, 25 true faults, 25 multiple choice, and you have, they're on a whiteboard, and you have one hour to complete them. Every test is randomly generated from a huge, huge, truly huge question bank, thousands of questions, uh, to generate your own artisanal free range, organic, gluten free exam. No gluten in that exam at all. Um, free range, too, totally organic. So everyone gets their own separate exam. And it scores automatically and gives you back your score. Now once you fire up an exam, the clock starts ticking. You can leave it. It's kind of like a movie. You can walk out of the movie anytime you want, but the movie keeps on going. So if you start an exam, be sure you have enough time to take it. Because otherwise if you leave and you go back, it will be, you know, the time will keep on ticking. The exams are 40% of your grade, now, the best four to five count, which you can use a couple ways. One way is this. If you do all four of the exams, and at, at the end of the semester, you look at your overall grade and say, you know, either you have an A or a grade you're happy with, 
you can decide to just not take the final exam five because the best four exams count. So if you don't take the final, then it would just get, get dropped. It's, in fact, right now it's scored as a zero. And so you look at your overall grade, it always shows you your grade assuming a zero on the final. So if you get to a grade, you're like, good enough for me, or an A, then you can just not take the final, unless you really enjoy taking exams. Now the final itself is different. Uh, it covers everything, all four sections. It's 100 questions, and but you have two hours to complete it. So if you don't need it, unless you just like taking exams, you can just avoid it. Now, why might you want to take it? Well, you might just like taking exams. But more likely, it, it can be used to replace one of your other exams. So if you've got a bad, you know, one of the four exams is bad, the final gives you a chance to swap that out. So if you do better on the final than one of your other four, it replaces it. If you do worse in the final than the other four, it gets dropped. So except for the possibility of emotional damage, the final can't do you any harm. Because if it's worse, it just gets dropped. If it's better, it's get, it gets kept. If you don't take it, and you do the other four, it gets <coughs> drunk. So the of the final is there to give, give you another shot at improving your grade. And if you're satisfied with your grade, then you can just, you know, leave it there, not, not mess with it. There are also lots of quizzes, many, many quizzes, fabulous quizzes. They originally designed back in the ancient days before Blackboard. I give, you know, one each week in, in, in the classroom. And they're set up in terms of basically one, one per week, or and then I added in a bunch of extra ones for, for more points. Now, there's a couple approaches to quizzes. One is you can do them as we cover the material. You can go in there and see, okay, what's this quiz about? We covered it, take it. The other option is do them all like at once and get them out of the way. Or another option is you can wait up until the deadline and just knock them all out at once. Basically, whatever works for you. Now, all the exams and quizzes are available now, but as the deadlines arrive, those things get closed off. So exam one is open to the deadline for exam one, but then once exam one deadline arrives, you can't, you can't get to it anymore. So you can complete stuff anytime you wish prior to the deadline. And the later stuff stays open the longest. So the quizzes are part four, they're there now. In theory, you could do the entire class right now. You just go there and take it. We're not recommended, but it could be done. So all the stuff is available from day zero, uh, but it's a good idea, a great idea to complete stuff before the deadlines. Here's how the quizzes work. Once you fire up a quiz, the timer starts. You have five minutes to complete it. Every question is five questions, true or false. And then when you're done, it scores it. Um, and again, the clock keeps on ticking. So if you leave the quiz, the clock keeps on on going. And they're 30%. Now of the quizzes, there's I think about 30 of them, and the best 10 count. Now once you get 10 perfect quizzes, then you're quiz capped, you're, you're done. You can't get any more quiz perfect. If you have less than 10 perfect quizzes, and your overall grade is less than an A, then taking more quizzes can still be worthwhile. Because if you do better on a quiz, it gets kept. If you do get, if you get worse, it gets dropped. So kind of like the final, doing more quizzes cannot cause any grade damage. So if your quiz average is like 83.4 and you keep taking more quizzes, it can't get any lower. The only thing you would do is stay the same or improve. And this is all done automatically. I don't have to go in and you know manually drop stuff or you know, Blackboard does this all automatically. So when you look at your grade on Blackboard, your overall grade is your real-time grade. That it's already doing all the dropping and keeping that it's supposed to do. Now, we'll talk in much more detail about the paper, uh, exactly how to do it, how it's graded, etc., uh, in the near future. But before going away from this, anything about this that needs more stuff. <coughs> Grade scale, pretty standard. 
89 to 100A, 89B, 779C, 669D, 059F. Now, if you go on Blackboard, you'll be able to see all your grades there. So every grade you get in the class, visible on Blackboard. That way you always know exactly where you are in the course. There's no like, and then the semester there's no like, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's, that's kind of scary. <laughs> I have no idea like what your grade might be. So at any given second, you can go to Blackboard and check to see what your grade is. Um, the Blackboard app, for some reason, has never worked properly. Even though I follow Blackboard rules, it has always given like weird results. Like, when I first started, when the app first came out, someone came to me and says, it says my grade is 16,000. What does that mean? Like, I have no idea. Uh, so use the web browser rather than the app. They might have fixed the app by now, but as of summer semester, no, it still wasn't working. And I didn't do anything weird. I didn't go in there and like, you know, hand code some Blackboard stuff or put in some weird, weird things. Just normal, normal stuff. So when you go to Blackboard and check your grade, you'll see a column, well, you'll see a grade for each thing you do, and you'll have the grade of its grade there. You also have a grade for your exams, which gives your exam score, your quiz score, and your paper score. Most importantly, you'll have an overall grade, well, a minus a column, but you'll have an overall grade grade. Now, at first, that will seem probably terrifying. If you looked at it, right now, everyone has a zero. That does not mean that you pre-failed the class. What it means is, right now, if you were just to not do anything, then you'd have a zero, which makes sense. If you don't do anything at all, you'd have a zero. As you do stuff, Blackboard automatically does its grading stuff. So as you do quizzes, it will pull, it's, right now it's pulling 10 quiz grades. But if you haven't done 10 quizzes, it's pulling 10 zeros. It's also pulling for exam grades, but if you haven't done an exam, it's pulling for zeros. It's pulling a paper grade, but if you haven't done the paper, it's pulling a zero. So it's doing exactly what it's supposed to, but all it's got to work with now is probably zeros. Now as you do stuff, you'll see your overall grade improve, hopefully. Because once you get the 10 quizzes, you'll see your quiz grade, you know, you'll be pulling 10 actual grades instead of zeros. And then for the overall grade calculation, you'll you know, make that, use that in there as that you know, 30%. Now, when looking at your grade, keep in mind the following things. First, anything you haven't done is treated as a zero because you haven't done it. Secondly, it's already doing all of the calculations, etc. So when you look at your overall grade, that's the grade you'd get if you just stopped and did nothing else. So the grade is truly accurate. Now, it's not your average though. So if you look at it and you say, how can I have, you know, 14% when I got an A on my first exam and A's on my first four quizzes, how can my grade be so low? And the answer is, yeah, you could be doing great on that one exam and those four quizzes, but the class requires, you know, four, four exams, a paper and 10 quizzes. And so it'll show you what you've done. Think of it kind of like a progress bar like how close you are to getting everything done. So again, initially you'll look pretty scary because until you have four, four exams, 10 quizzes in the paper, it's gonna be pulling a lot of zeros. But it is accurate. That is the grade you'd get if you just said, done, I'm not doing any more stuff. So it's not your, the grades that it shows are not your average. It's what your real grade would be if you just stopped doing stuff. So it looks scary first. Before pressing on, anything about the scary stuff that needs more Okay, there's all kinds of policies um, on the syllabus, including these, like, you know, don't cheat, show up, don't plagiarize, uh, wear clothes, I guess, uh, etc. There, If you want to uh, grind through those, again, they're all on the syllabus, and they're, you know, most of them pretty sensible. Uh, cheating, bad. Uh, the class, of course, does comply with um, American with Disabilities Act, etc. So all re reasonable accommodations will be will be met, of course. Uh, other stuff on there as well. Uh, probably the most couple of things worth, I guess, noting. I do have a frequently asked question file on Blackboard. So if you have like a question, good place to look first. 
Uh, but if you don't want to look at that or just don't find the answer there, just email me. Great discussion. Um, great discussion, of course, is welcome and invited. Uh, with like papers, I do have a you know very well established rubric, but of course, grading a paper is not like grading a math problem. There's always you know some room for discussion. So if you believe that your grade is unjust or inaccurate, just stop by an office with a copy of your paper and we'll go over it. The worst that would happen is you'd spend some time and that would, that would be the worst that could happen. The, your grade wouldn't get low. Unless there's like a last second confession to like plagiarism or you know, murder or something. The grade stuff is on uh, Blackboard. Again, that's, that's updated in real time. As soon as you do something, boom, it, it's up there. So you always know exactly what your grade is in the class and exactly what happens if you stop doing stuff. So that way there, there will be zero grade surprises, as long as you look on Blackboard. Incompletes, um, really difficult stuff on that. Uh, so if you think about getting one of those, be sure to look up all the requirements. Uh, makeups, fortunately, back in the ancient days before Blackboard, uh, the tests were done with paper. You know, people have to come in at special times, have to make special tests. And now makeups are, in a way, obsolete because you have uh, two months to complete exam number one. And so just get it done within two months. You know, and so if you don't get it done within that time, um, unless you have a really good excuse, then I generally don't do extensions because two months is probably enough time to do one exam. Now, for the exams, I was simply go over the deadlines. You, for exams one through three, will finish the section and you'll have a month after that to complete the exam. That's why there's no makeups because you have a whole, you have basically for the first exam two months to do it, for the second exam, you know, another two months, etc. Now, obviously, with exam four, there's no more after that. So, exam four is deadlines on, at the end because it's the end, and the final is at the very end, so there's no more after that. So, exams one through three, lots of time. Exam four is at the end, exam five, the very end. For the paper, there's all kinds of policies with paper. We'll go over those. Um, last day of office hours, anything, anything except for the final, be sure to resolve that by the last day. That way things are done. Unusual or special circumstances, by nature, are unusual or special. If you have a situation that impacts the class, let me know as soon as possible because if I know ahead of time, I can do things. If I find out, like, you know, after the grades are in, then in most cases there's nothing I can can do. So if there's something that does happen uh, that affects the class, again, let me know as soon as you can, and I make accommodations for all reasonable requirements. Okay, we also have the Academic Learning Compact, which is at the assessment site. This basically goes through um, the ALCs, and essentially it's a, our agreement with what kind of skills you'll get out of the class. Uh, firstly, writing stuff. You'll improve your writing skills, unless you're already super good, in which case, you know, hopefully I'll still be able to help you a little bit. Uh, two, critical thinking. We'll learn about arguments and stuff. Uh, critical concepts in philosophy. We'll do that. Uh, ethical and social responsibility, we'll have that in the ethical section. And doing uh, writing and philosophy specifically, that'll be with the paper. So we'll do all our you know, five ALCs. So if an administrator or somebody from SACS SOX, asked you about it, they talk about the ALC, you can, see, you can say, yes, I spoke about them, unless you don't like me, in which case you can say, nah, he never mentioned it. He's a terrible person. You should probably do something about him. Now, of course, we also have the QEP, which is quality eating pizza. No, um, that'd be delicious. Um, yeah, quality enhancement, you know, stuff. Now, our current one, of course, is right on FAMU, basically about the writing stuff. They have a whole bunch of stuff going on with that. And this is not one of those writing intensive courses yet. That was first done in English classes. But of course, we'll do writing, and it'll be good writing. Hopefully. So if you're asked about the QEP, you can honestly report to administrators or SACSOX people that I not only did talk about the QEP, 
I put the official logo on a PowerPoint slot, and if that's not commitment, I don't know what it is. Probably not a lot of commitment there. Calendar. Every day, uh, start of class, um, I'll put here the deadlines, and as deadlines die, I'll take them off the list. Kind of like a dead thing. Now, there are um, due dates and deadlines, and here's the difference. I thought about just going with deadlines, but because it creates some confusion, then I thought due dates are still useful. A due date is when it's due. What is the penalty for missing a due date? And the answer is nothing, to be honest. Due dates are mostly, you should probably do, do it by then, or you know maybe things won't work out so great. Deadlines, though, are if you don't do it by then, you don't want to, you'll miss your chance to do it. So, exam number one will finish up on September 21st, the stuff for part one. So, exam one is due then, which means you should probably do exam one around that time because all the material that we've covered, it'll be hopefully fresh in your mind. You'll probably do best on the exam then. Now, with the quizzes, though, they deadline September 31st, uh, sorry, September 21st, and that means that the quizzes of Carl 1, they'll be gone. But if you've done them, you keep your grades, of course, but if you haven't done them, you won't be able to do them again. So the thing to do is watch for the deadlines. And the important ones are basically these. September 21st, quizzes part one. Um, October 19th, exam one deadlines, so it's no longer available then, so you have you know, basically two months to do exam one. Quizzes part two deadline then. Then exam two, deadlines November 16th. Exam three um, is due November 16th as well. Quizzes part one deadline then. If you want to do a draft, we'll go more about this later. Deadline for that is November 9th. Now for the paper, and we'll see more of this in a bit, this is may create some slight confusion, but I think it's still worth doing, is it's actually multiple deadlines for the paper, depending on how many points you want to get. So the first important deadline is, if you want to do a draft, which is, I recommend, November 9th is the draft deadline. It's the last day you can turn in a draft. The paper on time bonus, you get if you turn the paper in through Blackboard, by end of day, you know, 11 to 9 p.m. on November 14th. And you turn it in through Blackboard, so you can turn it in from anywhere, you have an internet connection, and as long as it's in before 11 to 9 p.m., it's on time. Now the bonus is this. If you do the paper and turn it in when it's supposed to be turned in, you get five points just for being you and turning the paper on time. And people always ask about extra credit, and that is one piece of extra credit. If you want five points added to your paper grade, just complete it by then, upload it by then, and you get your base score plus five. Now when you see your grade for your paper, it'll already have the plus five in there, because Blackboard doesn't have like a system for like, you know, here's your grade, here's a plus five. So if your real paper grade was like an 86, you would see a 91 there instead of the 86, because like, you know, I'll just put the five onto your grade. Now, what if you don't want those five points? Well, in that case, there is the emergency deadline a week later. That deadline is intended for if things go wrong, but not like super wrong. And you basically have another week, no questions asked, to turn in the final version of the paper. And this one is full credit. So if you don't want the plus five points or just want more time or something happens, then you can turn it in on November 21st and you get full credit. And again, this is intended for computer problems, minor illnesses, except things that come up that interfere with doing the paper on time. So anyway, everyone gets like a free week extension, but you don't get the plus five bonus. There's no penalty, you just don't get the five points. Now, there's also the desperation deadline for when people say, oh crap, it's right, I'm in a class and I you know, need to have paper. 
and that is the uh, Friday you know, last um, day of classes, and that's a 50% deadline. And a paper turned in by then will get half credit. You may be thinking, what good is half credit? And the answer is this. For a not a tiny number of people over the decades, that's been enough between not graduating and graduating, getting that 69.22 that rounds up to a C and walking. And so half of something is better than all of nothing. Unless it's, you know, unless it's death and you want none of that. For the other, for the final, uh, for this class, December 13th, deadline is 5 p.m. Now again, with all the exams and quizzes and stuff, you can always do stuff ahead of time. Just be sure to do them before the deadlines. And in each class, I'll put the deadlines here, and I'll send out uh, announcements you know, regularly so you'll always know when things are due and when things are coming up. Now, with um, Blackboard, of course, as everyone knows, Blackboard is infested by demons. That's just that's something everyone knows. And they occasionally do terrible, terrible things because they're demons. And so if you have something that goes wrong in Blackboard, the thing to do is email me. Uh, let me know what class. I, I teach uh, all my classes are philosophy classes. So if someone says, I'm in your philosophy class, and something went wrong, I would reply back like, which class, who are you, what went wrong? So always include your name, the class. Uh, and this just, you can just say, you know, day intro and what went wrong. Now my default is, if something goes wrong with a quiz or exam, I can go in and look, and Blackboard shows, it logs everything. So it shows like what went wrong. And if something went wrong, I can see it. And what I'll do, my default is always reset the attempt. And now will the unfortunate thing is, well you probably have this, you've been a student for a while, you've probably seen this happen, that basically wipes out the attempt. So everything is back to you know, the start. And that's my default. So if you just say, you know, I have a problem with exam three, I'll just go, you know, check and confirm the problem, reset it. Now, in some cases, it may like lock up and not submit. If, if you want, if you want me to, you know, hit the submit button for you, let me know. So if you did say you like 49 questions on exam one, and the demons of Blackboard, you know, took possession of your exam, you're like, ah, I won't submit. Then you'd email me and say, hey, the demon's got my exam. Can you submit it for me? And I'll say, I'll take care of the demons, and I'll take care of them, and then click that, click that button. But again, if you don't say otherwise, my default is clear attempt. Now, for monitoring Blackboard, I um, keep it on and stuff, but I'm like old, so I don't stay up super late. I used to have the exams available to five, and then people said, you know, we do our exams at, you know, 11 and 12, and you know, I'm like, I can't stay up that late, because I'm super old. And so I do check it, you know, up until about, about five, especially like on Fridays, but after like five, you're on your own. So if you're doing your exam at like 11.30 Friday night, um, and you send an email saying like I'm locked up, I won't get that until Saturday morning. So I recommend um, doing exams like before the deadline, because that way if something goes wrong, I'll be able to reset it. And if it's something that happens after like when I'm, you know, not more blackboard, then it'll be kind of too late. Unless it's like the whole Blackboard system gets you know, taken over by all the demons. Then we have worse things to worry about, like all the demons. Okay, so that's the exciting um, syllabus. Before heading to just a brief introduction to the philosophy, because I want to make sure everybody gets their money's worth. Anything about the syllabus that needs more sill or butts? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, excellent question. So for the book thing, if you go on um, Blackboard, all the stuff you need, well, for the course, not everything in life, is on Blackboard. So if you go on there, the, the course is broken up uh, into four modules, one for each part. So if you like the module thing, you can go into the modules. If you don't like modules, you can go to, onto the menus by the topic. So there's a course document one which has all the readings, all the notes, all the PowerPoints, uh, and other stuff in there. There's also um, the book for the class. And as you know, as you might notice, when I'm talking about the people 
they're all, except for me, they're all dead. Uh, and the reason why is because when people are dead a long time, their work becomes public domain, which means it's now free. So when I was, I used to use the anthologies, and once the price hit like 150, I'm like, Ugh, that's a lot of money to pay for a book. And so I switched to using a PDF, using the same, you know, famous dead philosophers. The only downside is since I have to use people who are like dead or free, um, it's not the latest stuff. So you won't have like the latest cutting edge philosophy. But on the plus side, the cost of the book is zero. And it's the same stuff, 90% you know, of it is the same stuff you'd get in an expensive anthology. Yeah, so the, the book is basically a PDF, all the readings in there. There's also all the PowerPoints in there. There's also all the notes from day one to zero. All the exams and quizzes are on Blackboard as well. So all the stuff that you do, you'll, except for being here, you'll do through Blackboard. Also, you might notice I, um, you know, record the classes and I'll put them on uh, YouTube and put a link to the channel I recorded the previous classes. So if you ever miss a class or just have lots of time to kill on the YouTubes and run out of, you know, you know videos to watch, which probably is not possible, this stuff will be there. Okay, anything else? Okay, so in the remaining couple minutes, now, the most obvious question, of course, is intro to philosophy, what is philosophy? And the answer is pretty easy. The term philosophy comes from philo, which means love. It's like Philadelphia, city of loving cheesesteaks, I believe is the correct translation. And of course, Sophie means wisdom, Sophia, and so literally means love of wisdom. And so it merely raises two questions. What is love? And what is wisdom? And of course, there are a lot of questions about it, and a lot of songs about the first one as well. Now, philosophy as an academic subject can be looked at in a couple of ways. One way to sort of define it is based on the subjects it deals with. So for example, in the case of biology, biology deals with what? Well, living critters. In the case of dead critters too. Chemistry deals with chemicals, physics with you know physics stuff, medicine with medical stuff. And so one way we can define philosophy is based on the subjects. And next when next we meet, we'll go over you know, the various subjects in philosophy. Not all of them, but sort of the general sweeping view. A second way to sort of look at it is based on the questions that a field asks. So biology, for example, asks, what is life? What is a species? What is a final? What is DNA? Physics asks questions like, what is matter? What, is, what dimensions are there? Is there dark matter? Is there dark energy? Are there super strings? Are there silly strings? And various other questions. And of course, philosophy is jam-packed with questions. Now, two of the relatives of philosophy are science and religion. Now, science, interestingly enough, is the, the sciences of the children of philosophy. So, for example, if you get a doctorate in physics, you get a PhD, a doctor of philosophy in physics. Same chemistry, biology, etc. And the reason why is because well, literally, when something becomes, you know, more the end field and becomes more empirical, it stops being philosophy and becomes science. So one thing that we'll look at is people often say, well, philosophy doesn't do anything. It's useless. All this science stuff. Well, kind of the unfortunate thing is, or maybe fortunate, is when a part of philosophy starts doing stuff, they start calling it science. It'd be like saying that family doesn't do anything. When... Whenever the family does something, they have to change their name. It's like, yeah, they do a lot of stuff, the name just changes. Now, so next time we'll pick up talking about uh, philosophy, science, religion, and the branches of philosophy. So the good rest of the day. See you on Wednesday. If you get a chance to, be sure to sign the roll thing. Remember, it's got to be sure to get back to me so I can mark people's attention.